so nice to be home. Um, this is from the color purple, uh, where Seely, who's been abused and used, um, has rediscovered her life and rediscovered God is love and that love lives inside her. I don't need you to love me. I don't need you to love. I've got, I've got my sister, she may be here now, she may not see me, but she's still mine, I know. I've got my children, they may be here now, they may not see me, but they're still mine, I hope that they still love me. Got my house, though it still keep the cold out, got my chair, when my body can't hold out Got my hands doing good like they're supposed to Showing the love that the folks that I'm close to Got my eyes, though they don't see as far now They see more about how things really are now deep breath gonna hold my head up gonna put my shoulders back and look you straight in the eye I'm gonna flirt with somebody when they walk by I'm gonna sing out sing out There's inside of me everything that I need to live a bountiful life with all the love alive in me. I'll stand as tall as the tallest tree, and so I'm thankful for every day that I'm given, both the easy and hard ones I'm living. But most of all, I'm thankful for loving who I really am. I'm beautiful. Yes, I'm beautiful, and I'm
picked a perfect scripture to come home to today, by the way. We'll see what I mean in a minute. Good morning. I got you. It's good to see you. I invite you to look on the back of your order of service as we look at our scriptures for this morning. I want to call your attention to the Samuel passage, if you will. Just specifically verse 3. And then we'll move to the Mark reading as we do. I would ask you to stand for the reading of the gospel. And Samuel writes, All the leaders of Israel met with King David at Hebron. And the king made a treaty with them and in the presence of God. And so they anointed David king over Israel. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. If you are able. He left there and returned to his hometown. His disciples came along, and on the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place. He made a real hit, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good. How did he get so wise all of a sudden, get such ability? But in the next breath, they were cutting him down. It was a Baptist church. I'm just kidding. I'm I'm just kidding. Just kidding. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling, and they never got any further. Jesus told them, The prophet has little honor in his hometown, among his relatives, on the streets he played in as a child. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there. He laid his hand on a few sick people and healed them. That's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit of the other villages teaching. Jesus called the twelve to him and sent them out in pairs, gave them authority over and power to deal with the evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds. Keep it simple. And no luxury ends. Get a modest place and be content there until you leave. If you're not welcomed, not listened to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different. Right and left, they sent the demons packing. They brought wellness to the sick, anointing their body and healing their spirits. The gospel of our Lord for the people of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I assume you've all heard the expression, you can't go home again. Unless you're a millennial. (laughs) Then you just never leave. (laughs) If you are the person who has been living away, you have changed and so is home. Life at home has gone on without you and going home and expecting to fit right back in just doesn't happen. It's like being that square peg in that round hole. I don't really know much about Jesus' life before his public ministry began. And for whatever reason, the gospel writers don't write about it except they tell us when Jesus was 12, he amazed the scholars in the temple. It was obviously not that important to the early church for some particular reason, or we would probably have it written down. I do know this, though. When I was 12 years old, my Sunday school teacher at the original Broadmoor would take us every now and then to the Western Sizzlin, which was right there on I-55 at Northside Drive. And one Sunday, I decided I was going to be kind of funny, and I unscrewed all the tops of the salt shakers in the restaurant. (laughs) We got there early because you had to go to early church in order to go out to eat after Sunday school. Well, the manager didn't like it that they had ruined a bunch of food, and Mr. Salter was my Sunday school teacher, punny, right? And he was very upset with me. Many, many years later, I was visiting my sister-in-law who worked at Broadmoor, and all of a sudden, 
I felt this tap on my shoulder as I was waiting on my sister-in-law in the office. And I turned around, and lo and behold, there was Mr. Salter. I was actually serving as a youth minister in Baton Rouge at the time, and he said, are you John Brazier? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Salter, how are you? He said, fine. And he kind of looked me up and down. What do you do now, John? I'm a youth minister at Florida Boulevard Baptist Church in Baton Rouge. Puzzled, he stared right into my eyes and said these words. Interesting. I figured you'd be in Parchman. <laughs> so I understand this story about Jesus and going home. Clearly, he must have done something all those missing years, as John Prine would say. Today's text tells us that he was a carpenter, that that occupation might well have been, hey, go see Jesus, the guy the next street over. He can build you some furniture, or he can carve the yokes for your oxen, or he can make the wooden parts for the, for the farm or the plows, or even some household implements. It's definitely specific that they knew him and he knew them. What I find in Jewish culture, especially from what I've learned in my days of Old Testament study this summer, is that in those days, men were known from their fathers, but not in this particular passage. He's known as Mary's boy. Very interesting, especially in this patriarchal culture. In a society like Jesus's, everyone had a place and people didn't change places. So I guess carpenters with dubious parentage did not become rabbis, right? Yet they had heard that he had earned a reputation as being someone who did good things. Mark's gospel doesn't tell us what the content of his teaching was, but they did say that he was making the prophecy relevant. There are 17 prophetic books in the Bible, but there are way more than 17 prophetic people in the biblical story who had those kinds of roles. Some prophets were even so disliked they had to flee for their lives. Jesus, as we know, died on the cross, right? But you think about David. It's a complicated and emotional storyline, one that's full of fear, and one thing becomes clear David, regardless of what he had done, was blessed. David, regardless of what he had done, was blessed. God's favor shined upon David, right? I love technology. You think about it, he had waited long for this thing to come, for him to be king. And I wonder about us today. Today we may feel as though there is something that God has promised us, something very important to each of us in our own life. But it seems impossibly far away and incredibly difficult. Yet even in the midst of that waiting and those hardships, I don't think we can lose sight of God's vision for our lives and, and cease doing what is right. We've got to do what we know is right. Jesus could do few miracles in his hometown because people took offense at him, and I find that very perplexing. Their perception of him limited his ability to minister. I think we sometimes place limitation on others that we know in our lives, too. We overlook their skills and talents, pronouncing them ordinary rather than the precious individuals that God created them to be and to empower them to be what God has called them to be. We live in a world that celebrates strength, right? We praise great athletic accomplishments or strong-willed speakers. We hold those in high esteem, those who have big achievements in their lives. But Jesus' life and the lives of many others that he worked with showed a different way to be strong. Paul says in our scripture from Corinthians today that 
Power is made perfect in weakness. Think of folks like Gandhi or Mother Teresa. Their physical bodies are seen as weak, right? Frail nun and a man that fasted away, yet they had great inner strength. You and I probably aren't called to be the next Gandhi or Mother Teresa. We're called instead to admit that we might not be what the world called strong, but we find strength in our faith and a power in the grace that God revealed in Christ Jesus. Now, Leanne's here this morning, so she can affirm this testimony. When I go on a trip, I take a lot of things. I especially pack a lot of T-shirts, white T-shirts, because I wear a white T-shirt under another T-shirt which people think is stupid, but I really don't care because it's comfortable. And if I don't watch myself, I can pack way too many shirts. When Jesus called the disciples, he told them to bring the most essential thing, a stick to support them as they go. It must have been hard to leave behind the things that were important to them. It must have been hard to leave behind the things that helped them feel safe. And maybe it seems like a small thing, but our desire to pack too much in our lives can show that we really may not be relying on what God has for us. We can overpack in our desire to feel smart, attractive, or strong, or you name it, when we really don't trust God. Sitting around a pool yesterday with a couple friends and talking to them about Grant. And he goes, man, you just got to leave it with God. I'm tired of hearing that. I'm tired of hearing that. But you know what? It's what you got to do. It's what you got to do. Sometimes when we pack too much, we hold on to what makes us feel safe and secure. And we hold on to people or places in our lives that maybe we don't need them anymore. I really struggle with this passage growing up, especially as, you, as, as I try to learn more about what Jesus would have us to do and about the Bible, about the Old Testament, New Testament. And when he gets to the point and he tells them, shake the dust off your sandals if they don't receive your words, I thought, man, that's kind of harsh, you know? I don't, I, don't, I don't need you. In other words, I wash my hands of you. And as I studied this this week, I I realized maybe it's a hard task, but God's grace gave them courage. And I kind of liken it to what my dad used to do, especially when we lived in Baton Rouge. I'd come home from state for the holidays or summer or whatever, and my dad was always a very benevolent man. And he'd give 20 bucks here, 30 bucks here to people. And I'd just say, Dad, you know, they're going to go booze it up. He said, I It's not up to me what they do with it. It's up to me to give it. And I thought about that in this passage. We are responsible for our obedience to what God calls us to do. That's what Jesus is telling the disciples. Be obedient to what I'm telling you to do. You are not responsible for the results of your obedience. So where might you dust off your feet? And when you do, where might God's grace lead you? The end of the story, as we now have it in this passage, revealed that they were successful in calling people to repent and casting out demons and healing people. Maybe this was kind of a trial run for Jesus' absence as Mark later on began to serve with Paul and Barnabas. So I ask you this today, are you being obedient? It's a risky and a holy calling that each of us have. Join me as we pray. God, no matter what comes our ways today, opportunities or challenges, we know you are with us. 
Remind us that your grace is enough for this day. Especially when life is not what we feel like it ought to be. Remind us that your grace sustains us. For we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen.